Good evening. I think we can thank our musician for this evening, Morgan Davis, and perhaps give him a second round of applause. Thank you, Morgan. I would like to welcome all of you here tonight, particularly those that have traveled a long way to be here, and a special welcome to, to Professor Francesca Orsini's friends, family, and colleagues. Thank you also to those from other institutions who have joined us. A SOAS inaugural is special. It's a celebration and an enjoyable event for the whole SOAS community. This is the fifth of, of, of this year's inaugural lecture series. Professor Vas, Vas, Vasuda Dalmia will introduce Professor Orsini tonight. Vasuda Dalmia is Professor Emerita of, of Hindi and M M Modern South Asian Studies at the University of California, Berkeley, where she also held the Magistretti Distinguished Professorship in South and, and Southeast Asian Studies. She retired in 2014 as, as um, Yale University's first professor in Hindu studies. Her monograph, The, the Nationalization of Hindu Traditions, studies the, the, um, the life and writings of a major Hindi writer of the 19th century as the focal point for an examination of the intricate links between language, culture, religion, and nationalism in colonial India. Her work on drama, poetics, plays, and, and performances, the politics of modern Indian theater, traces the genealogies of theater in modern India, particularly the, uh, the appropriation of folk theater as it sought to constitute itself after independence. A collection of her essays was published recently under the title Hindu Pasts, Women, Religion and, and Histories. Professor Rachel Dwyer will deliver the vote of thanks. Rachel Dwyer is Professor of Indian Cultures and Cinema at, at SOAS. Her main research interest is in, is in Hindi cinema, where she has published books, articles, and essays on film, magazines, and popular fiction, consumerism and the new middle classes, love and, and eroticism, vi visual culture, religion, e emotions, stars and star families, and, the, um, and Gandhi and the by, and the biopic. We are very grateful to both of them for being part of this evening's event. Please join us for a drinks reception upstairs in the Brunei suite at the end of the lecture. Two final points, points of, um, of housekeeping. Please do note where the fire exits are in case the, in, in case the alarm sounds. And for those of you who want to tweet during the lecture, we do encourage it, but please make sure your phones are in silent mode. So, to introduce Professor Orsini, I will now pass over to, to Professor Dal Mia. Thank you. It's a privilege to be here on this important occasion and to introduce Professor Francesca Orsini once more to you. Most of you already know her, but not all of you may know the multiple directions of, of her scholarly work. I have known her since the early 1990s, when she was just embarking on dissertational research here in Suez. I have seen her grow from a very promising doctoral student to one of the most original and enterprising scholars in the field of Hindi literature. 
Her book, The Hindi Public Sphere, 1920 to 1940, Language and Literature in the Age of Nationalism, 2002, is considered a major landmark in the field of modern Indian literary studies. Based on material meticulously collected from a range of fields, education records, women's journals, peasant pamphleteering, political works, popular novels, as much as from high literature, it yet comes together as a tightly argued and clearly structured work on an immensely important period in the history of modern India. The two decades between the two world wars from 1920 to 1940. This was a period when the Hindi-speaking belt of North India had become the center of nationalist politics and aspirations. If, on the one hand, Gandhi had achieved the spectacular feat of turning the Indian National Congress into a party with wide mass appeal, with increasing participation by women, there was also vocal and physical resistance to economic exploitation by a large body of politicized peasants who were demanding radical reform in the mode and manner of exacting revenue. Modern Hindi literature was fanning out to include these voices. Mainstream nationalism was thus just one major artery in the body politic of North India. The conflict resolutions which were found then were the, uh, anticipated, anticipated the currents, largely conservative, that were to manifest themselves yet more clearly in independent India and determine the course that the, uh, that the Hindi literary can, and indeed Hindi as the official language of the nation was to take. Dr. Osini is the first scholar to have charted this course in such a brilliant and conclusive fashion an incredible feat for what was originally a doctoral dissertation. Her second monograph, Pleasure and Print, Popular Literature and Entertaining Fictions in Colonial North India, 2009, represents the first comprehensive attempt to gauge the impact of the popular press in Hindi and Urdu in post-1857 British North India. Dr. Osini mines a large and largely untapped uh, uh, archive in order to explore the role of popular songbooks, theater transcripts, serialized fiction, and chapbooks at large in the creation of, the Hindi, of, of Hindi public culture. She asks, how did the new technology of printing and the enterprise of Indian publishers make the book a familiar object in a largely illiterate society? What genres became popular in print? Who read them and how were they read? In doing so, Dr. Osini discovers and recreates worlds lost to a wider North Indian audience after the Hindi-Urdu divide. At the same time, she traces the slow crystallization of Hindi as different from Urdu, even in popular print, an act first cemented in the 1890s detective novel industry, and in that pleasure of all pleasures, the kissa or tale of Chandrakanta, a fantastic tale so popular that people learned Hindi in order to read it. With her training in high as well as popular literature from the late 19th century to the present century, Dr. Osini next embarked on a challenging multi-year project on the literary cultures of 15th to 17th century in North India. As the research of the last decades has shown, modern Hindi reaches back no earlier than two centuries at most. However, it rests on and draws upon a range of literary cultures, many of which have today come to be regarded as regional variants of Hindi, or indeed polarized to such extent, as in the case of Urdu, that they are regarded as entirely disconnected with each other. Conceived in collaboration with historians, literary scholars, and a well-known ethnomusicologist, this project consisted of a series of workshops conferences, lectures, and seminars revolving around the issues emerging from the consideration of multilingual literary cultures with multiple locations of literary production, locations that ranged from regional and imperial courts to Sufi centers, Hindu temples, monasteries, and village squares. The texts that came into being were the product of 
complex interchange between these locations and of the people involved in their production and dissemination. Poets, performers, and connoisseurs often buy or even trilingual people who straddled several dominions and languages. Dr. Orsini organized three large conferences on the historically understudied long 15th century on Indo-Persian literature and multilingual India and on orality and performance. The two co-edited volumes that have resulted from this project after Timur left, Culture and Circulation in 15th Century North India, 2014, and Tellings and Texts, Music, Storytelling, and Performance in North India, 2015, are not only path-breaking, they open several further avenues for further scholarship. Most of all, the challenge simplistic notions of two separate and Hindi literary histories and Hindu and Muslim as belonging to two mutually exclusive monolithic religious communities. Dr. Ozini's present project, Multilingual Locals in Significant Geographies for a Bottom-Up Approach to World Literature, grows naturally out of this work, which showed so clearly that the multilingual culture of early modern North India built the bedrock from which the modern and the so-called post-colonial have grown. The complex connection of these multilingual and multilocational cultures to any simplistic notion of world literature is thus easily imaginable. It is to explore these connections that Professor Orsini's present comparative project, supported by the European Research Council and covering the course of colonialism and nationalism, has developed along with co colleagues working on the Maghreb and the Horn of Africa. There is virtually no work that engages in such cross-cultural investigation. Professor Orsini's lecture today is based on the research for this new project and is entitled Literature in a Multilingual Society. Well, thank you all. Thank you particularly for uh, Professor Dalmia, for Vasuda, for coming such a long way. Uh, to Rachel, Professor Dwyer, for being my oldest SOAS friend since 1992. To all of you for coming. Um, I'm not sure if Alok is here yet. <laughs> Maybe he will come. Um, I hope, but well, my family is also here, and I hope they will perhaps finally understand what multilingual is about, <laughs> though I'm not sure. Um, and the last thing, I'm sorry, I mean, I actually became a professor two years ago, but for sort of various reasons, couldn't give this talk before, so Paul Webley can't be here, and that's a, that's a regret, but what to do, all completely my fault. So let me start with um, a concrete example. This is an example of ordinary multilingualism from the second half of the 19th century, uh, played out among small towns in the hinterland of colonial Benares. Um, Bhanu Pratap was born in a village and raised first by his grandfather while his father was working away in Mirzapur. Um, his short autobiography, uh, which he wrote in, finished in 1890, is basically a catalogue of what he studied and read and with whom. Um, first, his grandfather made him learn by heart a large number of devotional couplets between the age of three and a half and five. Then at five, after his tonsure ceremony and the ritual worship of study books, his grandfather taught him Hindi and Sanskrit, while a local pious man read with him modern Hindi, a modern Hindi prose version of Krishna's life, and most of the works by the late 16th century poet Tulsidas in, one of the, in the old literary dialects of Hindi. At age eight, Bhanu Pratap's father decided it was time for him to learn Farsi, Persian. And here is the ritualized way in which his teacher at Chunar Mission School began his instruction. Now, if we look back at um, Bhanu Pratap's education, what strikes us is, well, first of all, how patchy it was, how it was basically ge geared as stacking up language skills, how little of it happened in schools. What about his literary tastes? 
the archive where I found his autobiography holds his manuscript Hindi translation of the Persian classic Sadi's Gulistan, and one with the, the couplets that his grand grandfather made him uh, learn by heart. And he also tells us that he uh, wrote a local history of the town of Chunar. But what we note from his autobiography is that a literary taste begins through acquiring language and a sensor of meter through memorizing a large number of verses in Hindi and Farsi, that he acquired most of his language skills and poetic taste through formal study, but Urdu poetry, for example, seems to have been a byproduct of learning Persian. He, he never mentions studying it with, uh, with a master. And all these um, tastes are shared practices, as you, actually, as you can see, um, practices of reading, recitation, and singing. Bhano Pratap shares his tastes with different people who only partly overlap. With some people, he shares devotional singing and discourse. Uh, satsang, his family was initiated in the devotional group, group called Daryapant, and they, they were perhaps also keen on Hindi courtly verse. With others, he shared Hindi, Persian poetry, and it's not quite clear from, from, um, from what he says whether he ever developed a taste for English literature, for example. He talks of English knowledge, but did he read English literature? We don't know. Um, and also, in fact, literature in modern Hindi. He's an exact contemporary of um, the father of modern Hindi, Bhartendu Harishchandra of Benares, but he doesn't mention reading him or reading newspapers, nor does he mention the Great Revolt of 1857, for that matter, though he was you know, right there in where, where it happened. <laughs> um, Endowed with a great keen sense of authorship, Banu Pratap, as you can see, translates the Persian verses into Hindi meters and enacts a kind of cultural equivalence. So he, he quotes the Persian uh, verse and then he gives in the margin his own verse, Rajbasha translation. Um, and Allah becomes Ishwar and the Persian emperor becomes Lord Ram. So I will return to some of these points later in the course of, of this lecture. For the moment, I think we can already pull out a few observations. First, that multilingualism is structural to his society, particularly in terms of education and of poetic and religious cultivation and practice. However, it is not uniformly spread, which means we must avoid generalizations and pay attention to each particular configuration, as Ronit Ricci was teaching us, telling us today, earlier today. Um, second, diglossia, that is the, the hierarchy between a formally learned high language and a colloquial low language, is definitely there. We'll see it plays a large role in language ideologies, the way in which people think about and invest languages with value, but it by, by no means exhausts literary tastes and practices. Persian and English are valued by Bhanu Pratap, but that does not, doesn't um, does not make Hindi a language that is dominated by them, nor are these languages all struggling for the same stake in a single literary field, as Pierre Bourdieu and his successors would have us think. Third, formal institutional spaces, the school, the literary canon, and so on, do not tell the whole story, and we need to be wary of models that rely only on them to account for the dynamics of power, um, or, or power uh, for the dynamics of power relations in a literary culture whether it's the court in the early modern period or, in, or later the colonial education system, state literary academies, or currently the world book market. None of them can claim to tell the whole story. So what I want to do today um, is to go through the questions that actually I laid out in the abstract one by one, thinking about how they relate dynamically to each other and how different configurations are produced as we move from the um, pre-colonial to the colonial and post-colonial periods. So how does literature work in a within a multilingual society? How can we know? Spoken and, uh, by and multilingualism are widespread enough, but what about written literature? How do multilingual practices square with language ideologies of nationalism and of English as a global language and the language of world literature? Interestingly, if, if you ask writers locally, they will often say that they have little or no interaction with writers in the other languages. So do members of social literary communities live in worlds sealed by language then? Aware of each other only by name, perhaps? Finally, if you are a literary multilingual, how does that work? 
Do the different literary tastes and traditions you acquire live separately within your head, or do they interact and produce new outcomes? So, let me start. How can we know? This is a question about methodology, but also about epistemology and the intellectual and practical obstacles to this kind of inquiry. Documents like Bhano Pratap's autobiography, which explicitly tell us how he acquired language and literary tastes, are quite rare, unfortunately, as are also the authors who actually compose in more than one language. Moreover, early modern archives, whether Persian or Hindi, devotional or courtly, already practice their own exclusions or develop pet stories to explain multilingual literary practices. Usually they involve the poet falling in love with somebody from the other community. And that explains why they wrote in that language. So, so if you were writing a biographical dictionary of Persian poets um, or, of, um, or of Sufis, a taskira, you would at the most mention that so-and-so also liked to compose Hindi poetry, but frustratingly for us, you would not say what Hindi poetry exactly, or in fact what he meant by Hindi. And, uh, and you certainly did not quote it. So how can we know? Well, apart from putting together the available language archives, we need to look for any evidence of what Karen Thornber usefully calls readerly, writerly, and textual contacts. That is, what and how people read in, it, in other languages, either in the original or in translation, interactions between authors in different languages, and evidences within text, translation, citation, rewriting, and this often involves looking for mere traces of the other languages. Uh, so on the left here, you have a, a trace of a, of a listening practice. This is a Sufi manual telling uh, disciples how they should interpret the Hindi, uh, the, the phrases and expressions that come up in, Hin in the Hindi songs they listen to. So the text is in Persian, the red is Hindi. You know, you've got this trace and it's a trace of a listening practice, actually. Mm? And on the other side, instead, you have, um, I mean, they look similar, but actually the one on the right is basically in Avadi, an early form of, of Hindi. And the multilingual trace are those little uh, glosses, uh, Persian glosses for every word. Mm? And this is more a kind of a, a, a trace, an evidence of a kind of a serious editorial interest by a, by a sort of Persian uh, intellectual into a vernacular text. But we also need to look for silences, gaps, exclusions. What or who is not mentioned, though we know they were there? And that's why in the course of the project, we, we, we keep going back to a geographical approach, looking at who lives where and gets mentioned or not mentioned. Why aren't they mentioned? In other words, apart from the multilingual relationships that contemporaries or later scholars are happy to acknowledge, we have to become sensitive to the unacknowledged presences. And we also become wary of generalizations, even those made by contemporaries. Nobody could speak Persian, everybody could understand Persian. Only Brahmins knew Sanskrit, everyone was multilingual. Only the elites were multilingual, and so on. They usually issue from strong ideological positions, and actively produce ignorance. And I have become very interested in the production of in ignorance. Um, and I hope I'm not producing any ignorance today. <laughs> um, for example, literary histories focus on writing rather than other on practices of re reading or listening. So even books on um, Muslim writers in Hindi present them as exceptions. Those few good Muslims who loved Hindi and served it rather than as members, you know, members of this sort of multilingual society who listen to the same tales, the same songs, and occasionally wrote them. For the study of literature in a multilingual society, instead, accounts of ordinary practices of performance, listening, reading, and of ordinary people like Bhano Pratap are absolutely crucial in order to place books, the material objects um, that come to us in particular scripts and formats, in a wider context, in the fullness of their social world. And this brings me to the second point. So much of the work of the project on the multilingual literary culture of, um, in early modern North India uh, that uh, uh, Professor Damia mentioned did exactly that, trying to place textual objects in fuller and more connected, in a fuller and more collected social world, starting from two simple assumptions. The first one is this. <clears throat> 
So instead of modern language ideologies that pit languages and their speakers against each other, it is surely better to think of languages, including literary idioms, as dialogical and shared systems of communication and expression, as Mikhail Bakhtin taught us. Some people indeed do think that a language belongs or belongs more to them, but that doesn't usually stop others from using it. Second, even people who write and converse with their peers in a high language, whether Persian or English, always, almost, almost always know the vernacular and have some access to oral performative genres in it. By the same token, exposed to state apparatuses and religious rituals that use high languages, even illiterate people usually have some limited oral understanding of high languages or snippets of them, whether it's quasi-Sanskrit shlokas or Hindi matrix English. I think of, of dog Latin, and in fact may include them in their songs. The fact that so many of the literary genres of early modern India were meant for recitation, singing, or performance, as the essays in tellings and texts show, supports the point that while the study of literary history is often all about written texts, it is imperative that we uh, imagine them as part of context of oral access and transmission. Look at this example by uh, Maluk Das, a kind of local uh, devotional poet from the early 17th century. Now, he was not educated in Persian, and yet you can see this, this, this um, poem, his song poem, is, is, is full of Persian words and expressions. Um, now, we can view this quasi-Persian of this and other poems as Persian overheard, and in turn, the poem makes those snippets of Persian current among listeners who also do not know the language. Now, of course, the next question is why do we find so many Persian phrases and so many reference to the guy, the peer, the court of the Lord, and the repetition of his name, zikr, in devotional song poems like this? Now, one, one way of looking at them has been in terms of religious syncretism, that Maluk Das was trying to create something new between different Hindu and Muslim religious positions and identities. But the Bakhtinian view would see this as Maluk Das using a shared religious and poetic idiom that was current around him and reaccenting it and giving it a, his new uh, sort of um, um, meaning. After all, uh, we went to the small town of Kara, um, and he, there his place was only a stone throw from an important Sufi establishment. So it made sense for him to know, to show that he, um, that, that he who in fact used many poetic idioms, uh, to show that, that he had command over the poet, poetic as well as spiritual truths. The counterexample of this kind of oral access to high language is the presence of, of uh, courtly Hindi poetry, songs, and Hindustani music within Persophile Mughal culture, from the heart of the imperial court to its provincial outposts, as the important work of Catherine Schofield and Alison Bush has, has showed us. This created a widely shared intermediate aesthetic, as they, as they call it, of um, poetry, poetics, song, music, and art. Now, uh, what happened to this uh, connected multilingual world and this intermediate aesthetics under colonialism, its seismic upheaval of established forms of patronage, and its new ideas about knowledge and art? Catherine Allison and Molly Aitken asked two years ago last year. Well, quite a few things happened, pulling in various directions. And it's interesting, I think, accounts of the colonial encounter that consider only the world of English typically tend to overlook them. So let me go through some of these points. Um, an altered equation between languages and between the oral and the written was at the heart of this transformation. So let's move on to the 19th century and beyond. So for one thing, in the middle of the, and later half of the 19th century, we actually witness an intensification of eclectic multilingualism. I don't think people have attempted a comparison, but there are striking similarities between the, the last king of Avad, Vajid Ali Shah, who as Richard Williams has shown, remained active in his Calcutta exile until the 1880s, and the father of modern Hindi, Bhartendu Harishchandra, the subject of Vasudha Dharmya's path-breaking monograph. <clears throat> 
Both of them were trained in high languages and poetic traditions, but both of them combined high tastes with a strong interest in drama and in popular songs and festivals. And Bartendu was also very involved in journalism, new prose genres, and in elaborating new community ideas about language and literature. And yet his practice remained playfully eclectic. The new ideologies of language and community, on which more in a minute, jarred with, this multilingual, uh, with these multilingual practices. And in the case of Harish Chandra in Urdu, for example, produced an interesting contradiction. So on the right, you have his statement um, to a colonial education commission condemning Urdu as the language of pimps and prostitutes. On the left, uh, you see um, two different uses by him uh, of the Urdu ghazal. The one below for satirical purposes, so in a sense in a line with, uh, with his views, you could say, but the one above in a, for purely devotional purposes. So, um, and I would say that this slippage or straightforward contradiction between ideas about language and, lit and literary practices becomes a hallmark of modern multilingual literary culture to the point that multilingual practices can be understood as the return of the repressed as uh, will become clear at the end. Second, while we saw with, with Bhanu Pratap at the beginning that education for him was all about acquiring languages and that formal schooling had been only a small part of it, the growth of formal colonial education had momentous consequences for the acquisition of literary tastes. This new strong hierarchy with English at the top the sense of colonial inferiority towards metropolitan English and literary, English literary models that still bugs uh, local critical discourse, whether it's realism for novels or romantic expression for, and nature for poetry, and the alienation from one's literary traditions, what Ganesh Devi has called colonial amnesia, are only part of this process. Other consequences have been the centrality of exams and textbook education, which devalues and discourages the exploration of literature beyond the syllabus. The equation particularly of Hindi with national character building has led to the choice of edifying, like pillars of independence, as reading material, as your you know, fun reading material, of edifying and usually terribly boring poems and stories in school textbooks. Um, this implicitly suggests to school children that Hindi literature is inferior and much less fun to explore than English. So while post-colonial colonial and post-colonial education have continued to be multilingual, they haven't stopped, and where um, it is a different kind of multilingualism, more hierarchical, and where the acquisition of a higher language is usually accompanied by a strong disregard for the other language and an increasingly limited literacy in it. A parallel development. We've seen elite literati like Vajid Ali Shah and Bhartendu Harishchandra who were intensely interested in oral popular genres, particularly songs. And yet from the early 20th century onwards, these genres have been seen as part of folk literature, romanticized as anonymous, rural, traditional, atemporal, and thus non-modern. This has contributed to a separation between literature proper and folk literature and the marginalization of oral poets and performance, like Ramata Avatar Yadav Virahia, and of non-standard varieties of Hindi and Urdu. A marginalization that translates as complete absence from textbooks and literary histories. It just stops being there. Yet not all cha changes uh, in the colonial period led towards the hegemony of print and written literature over oral practices or the dominance of colonial English. After all, expanding the treasure trove of modern literature in one's language was one of the cornerstones of nationalism. So two more elements need to be considered. First, regarding the equation uh, between oral and written, poetry meetings, Urdu Mushairas, but also Hindi Kavisam Melan, which became public affairs in this period. In fact, the prime cultural events at nationalist meetings and later in cross-state diplomacy ensured the continuing currency of orally transmitted poetry. The Urdu Mushaira and Ghazal in particular entered a symbiotic relationship with print culture across scripts. So I think they were among the first uh, 
genres that were published e easily in Devanagari and in Roman, uh, Roman letters. Um, but also then with radio, with cinema, and more recently, digital technology. Try typing Mushaira on, uh, on the, um, in YouTube and see you know, the whole channels that are dedicated to them in the subcontinent and among the, the South Asian diaspora. And finally, a new aspect of print culture under colonialism was the dramatic broadening of literary horizons through translation. Readers and authors in the early modern period were aware of the literary world, uh, the wider world, uh, for sure, but their literary world was shaped by the reach of their languages. Your world extended as far as the languages you had access to um, uh, did, so whether Sanskrit, Persian, Arabic, or, or Hindi. Um, by contrast, for curious intellectuals like the Urdu poet, translator, and critic Miraji, Translation through English became a way of continuously expanding uh, his literary world. English here acted as a conduit, not for a colonial provincial mentality, but for a new cosmopolitanism that in fact undermined England's supposed centrality. So see here how Miraji translational activity <coughs> entailed looking both east and west, and not inhabiting a peripheral position vis-a-vis -vis Europe or Britain, even if um, uh, the 12 volumes of um, translations by Powys Mathers, Eastern Love, was his primary uh, source. <laughs> How do multilingual literary practices in reality square with, the, with ideologies of language nationalism and of global English? Well, I think we've already found some answers. Everywhere in the subcontinent, new ideas about language as belonging to a spe specific communities rather than a shared system of communication. New ideas about multilingualism as layers of language with the mother tongue somehow at the core, uh, and the others are come on top. Veneers uh, was a word that we use today. Uh, and new ideas about the need for a single language for the sake of national unity and the proper functioning of a state, of the state, all have played havoc with multilingual practices and histories, and continue to do so. So quite suddenly, Persian and Urdu became foreign languages, the carriers of a non-Indian Abhartya culture. In most of South Asia, post-colonial nation states and policymakers have perceived multilingualism as a problem, not as a resource. And multilingual education, the so-called three-language formula, as a burden for the child so it didn't seem to be one for Bhanu Pratap, as we saw. Moreover, ideologies of language and community and of language nationalism themselves clash with the equally widespread idea of English as the language of opportunity, now more accessible through the mushrooming everywhere of private schools and coaching institutes, that yet still tantalizingly difficult to master. And while, as I said, in the colonial period, the introduction of English education coincided with a strong nationalist investment in the creation of modern literatures in Indian languages, which resulted in bilingual intellectuals who read also in English and wrote in Hindi, Urdu, Bengali, and so on, in more recent years, the ever-growing emphasis on English in education, this global English, you, know, you learn English and you, you reach the world, um, is accompanied by a perception of one's own language as a handicap. Uh, uh, people talk of you know, their own language as a handicap that needs to be overcome. In such a context, it takes a real shift in vision to imagine a less agonistic multilingualism, and it takes strong counterforces to lead one to discover, rediscover, and cultivate literary interest in those languages. As many, in fact, of our um, English educated students from India or from uh, South Asia who rediscover Hindi, Bengali, Urdu literature here at SOAS will tell you. But luckily, those forces exist, do exist. Yet it's interesting that whatever they hew, modern language ideologies tend to pit languages against each other and believe in a kind of language Darwinism. In instead, the multilingual poet and intellectual Arvind Krishna Merhotra suggests alternative metaphors, languages as sources of light, attended by eclipses and penumbral zones, languages as lightning conductors, earthing each other's electric storms, 
Languages as geological faults, sending mild tremors through each other. Languages as conjugate mirrors. Even today, multilingualism does not have to be so agonistic, so hierarchical, particularly when aesthetic experience and expression are involved. Two more points. This is one of my favorite examples. The leading Urdu literary critic, Shamsuraman Faruqi, and the late leading scholar of early Hindi, Dr. Kishori Lal, both lived in Allahabad, but never met once. <laughs> there was never a common platform, a space, an opportunity for them to meet. As in Rashi Rohatgi's recent study of the multilingual literary culture of Mauritius, the evidence suggests that institutional meeting places or voluntary associations that cut across language boundaries, the Saiti Academy, the Jan Vadi Le Kaksang, and so on, are essential. Otherwise, social hierarchies earlier, and now circles of taste and literary habitus, keep communities of writers largely divided on the basis of language. So unlike Bhanu Pratap's overlapping circles of literary acquaintances then, multilingualism seems to have become more a case of knowing the names of, um, of writers in other languages, or just of readerly contact through translations rather than direct contact between writers, apart from fleeting occasions such as literary festivals. So the Jaipur Literary Festival, though largely in English, consistently gets Bhasha writers, as writers not in English are called, to come and speak, and has panels with writers from different Indian languages. The language Darwinism that I mentioned earlier also means that it is hostile statements that make the news, reinforcing uh, mutual wariness, like the spat in the 1990s between critic Minakshi Mukherjee and writer Vikram Chandra on Indian writing in English and the question of authenticity, or the more recent controversy of a best-selling English writer, Chetan Bhagat, who said that those who read Hindi novels are not cool. And that got uh, you know, a blog in a Hindi writers, uh, by a Hindi writer protesting, and there was a controversy. So within this context, any occasion, like the Samanbai Literary Festival, in fact, uh, where, write, where writers, readers, and orators from different languages, including English, can meet and interact in an atmosphere of mutual respect and curiosity is really important. And those who create such occasions are to be congratulated. It is the lack of curiosity and self-doubt that still stings in Salman Rushdie's famous pronouncement. Um, and here, I think, is an example of the production of ignorance, uh, if ever there was one. <laughs> now, my final point. How does a small question. How does literary multilingualism <laughs> work in practice? Do writers and readers cultivate the various languages and language literary tastes separately, or do they mix them? Now, to go back once more to Bhanu Pratap, he sang and recited devotional poetry with his satsang circle and the Persian text with other mentors and friends. Although he translated across poetic idioms, uh, Persian into Brajbasha, he did not mix them. And I think, by and large, in the, in the early modern period, that's what happens, that people cultivate, you know, you, you have to learn poetics, you learn meter, and you cultivate those literary poetic tastes separately. If you mix, it's at the level of uh, register, you don't mix meters, for example. And, or you say, you know, like this poet, he's really, um, you know, grounded in Hindi in Hindi poetry, his, his uh, learned meter, prosody, and the many forms of Hindi poetry, he has strolled through Persian poetry. Huh? So clearly knows it, has, uh, knows it less well. Um, in the 20th century, with literary communities align more on the basis of language, we see an interesting tension emerge between implicit expectations that readers are monolingual and attempts to include um, a variety of registers and poetic forms. So we have this interesting paradox that the same readers who relish Urdu ghazals or folk song in Hindi films are expected not to understand them as written literature. Whereas commercial publishers in the 19th century simply transliterated bet uh, between Urdu and Hindi, they didn't change anything. From the early 20th century, we have actual word substitution and on the basis that Hindi readers will not understand Urdu words. <laughs> 
So when you come across writers like Ugra, who references the range of poetic taste, you know, Urdu, Brajvasha, Urdu, so on, that Hindi readers had access and responded to, or Renu, who, in, uh, who incorporates many popular song and performer genres in his novel, it's then that we become aware how much narrower, narrower the range has become in most Hindi literary texts. So for writers who continue to be sensitive multilinguals, for whom to echo Arvind Krishna Merhotra languages are lightning conductors earthing each other's electric storms, how does their multilingualism find expression? For many poets, even if they write only in one language, the strategy has been to become translators, using translation like Miraji to connect and to connect to idioms and repertoires far flung in time and space and make them part <coughs> of themselves. About, about the Bombay bilingual Marathi English poet Arun Kolatkar, Mehrotra writes, occasionally Kolatkar translated his Marathi poems into English but mostly he kept them, the two separate. Sometimes he wondered what the connection between them was or if there was any connection at all. Kolatkar created two very different bodies of work of equal distinction and importance in two languages. The achievement, I think, uh, Merotra continues, has few parallels in world literature. What has a parallel, at least in India, is that he drew in his work from a multiplicity of literary traditions. He drew on Marathi, of course, and Sanskrit, which he knew. He drew on the English and American traditions, especially black American music and speech, and he drew on the European tradition. He drew on a few others beside. As he said in an interview once, talking about poets, anything might swim into their can. And I think in this, poets seem to be more Catholic and more acknowledging of their Catholicity than fiction writers, for some reason. My conclusions. A multilingual approach to literature is not so much about knowing many languages, but developing a particular vision, being interested in the position of texts and traditions in the wider multilingual world, and exploring how literary multilingualism works, rather than having some fixed idea or model of it. It means looking for tensions between statements and practices, for silences and exclusions, and for discontinuities. Not expecting everything to fit. If it, if it doesn't fit. It shouldn't fit. Madam, iski kya prasangikta hai? What is the relevance of this? A college student in Delhi asked me last year <laughs> when I spoke about this work. And I've been trying to uh, answer him ever since. <laughs> So, well, for one thing, this shows that the, the past to be more layered, connected, and interesting than the flat clash of civilizations that we are presented with in India today. Taking multilingualism seriously and through its traces, following how it changed along with changes in society and culture is a starting point to question ideas about language, what the archives do or do not keep, receive narratives of literary history, and so on. Having a longer view also helps us question not the power dynamics which literature is necessarily part of, but the relentlessly agonistic views that govern both nationalist narratives as well as recent models of, um, of world literature. Modern institutions see multilingualism as a problem, as I said, as if monolingualism were the norm and put forward as, and pitch language against language. From very different premises, the same is true of many post-colonial and world literature approaches. Exposing the dominance of English or French becomes wittingly or unwittingly a way of ignoring the literary worlds beyond them. The discourse of English as the global language and the language of world literature seems to suggest that everyone reading or writing in other languages may as well stop. <laughs> but multilingualism the coexistence of multiple aesthetic codes and repertoires refuses to go away. In India, Urdu is a good example, given its almost disappearance from formal education. Recently, we have seen a real return of the repressed, whether it's the impressive website rechta.org, uh, the festival Jashne Rechta, or the resurgence of Dastan storytelling, and of course, the ever-present Mushairas. Rechta.org gives Urdu poems in Urdu, Hindi, and Roman scripts with explanations, tutorials, um, historical background, and much more. 
Poetry recitals and dastan performances require no script to savor the taste of the language. Their popularity shows that a society used to accessing several aesthetics is reluctant to give them up and have only one. Finally, how does one become multilingual? And this is for light comic relief <laughs> when I was doing my PhD in Montague Street, uh, living in Montague Street. Um, though unfortunately I started much later than Bhanu Pratap, I wish I had started memorizing my couplets at three and a half. <laughs> for me too, becoming multilingual has been a continuing, probably a lifelong process and a very happy one shared with different informal groups of people. And I'd like to thank all of them here, including Alok, who, I don't know if he's here, but he's the one uh, with the glasses as part of the Urdu club. These groups, <laughs> these groups only partly uh, overlapped, and they're all outside institutional frameworks, interestingly. For each of us, I think, becoming multilingual, acquiring a multilingual approach, has fostered an attitude towards literature and the world that is one of discovery, not of mastery. We bring this attitude to the project that we have just started, which will compare the modern multilingual literary cultures of North India, the Horn of Africa, and the Maghreb. And I hope many of you will want to be part of it. Thank you. Francesca's work has been of such, such an important level and so important to so many of us for so long. It's also one of the few talks in your life that you give at SOAS where you get to wear a rather silly costume, perhaps. <laughs> one very much designed for men, and it's my years of experience with graduation I know about you have to wear the button um, for wearing these robes. It's also rather nice that you give a talk and you don't get any questions. <laughs> so I can hardly begin to sum up this project, which is so amazing. But I think when you heard Francesca talk there, you got some idea of why Francesca has become a professor at SOAS. Um, not only, of course, her own multilingualism, which is so important, but this blend she really brings to her work of very lightly mixing all these topics from the personal, from the account of one person, from a real close-up on somebody's life and their knowledge of language, to these huge questions taking us almost spinning out from here across these points, asking important questions, where are language boundaries and where are they communications? Because I think we do tend to think of communications so much more than boundaries there. This attention she pays to texts but also to speech is important. Differentiating literature from spoken language, but different genres within that literature, I think really came out to me so clearly today um, in her speech. But I know it's 7.30, and so I can't even begin to repeat with any form of elegance what Francesca has said, so I will take this literally. I'm not quite sure what I vote for, but I know I am, I'm here to give thanks. And thanks to Francesca. I think thanks to Francesca from all of us here tonight, really, the fact people have come here tonight to hear her speak. And so I can do it on behalf of the many, but it's not just us who are here in the audience tonight who want, would want to thank Francesca. So I'm going to speak on behalf of all sorts of people who haven't appointed me. Um, Francesca, from the point of view of Hindi, I mean, Francesca's really kept Hindi not just alive at SOAS, but kept SOAS as a world centre for Hindi. And also, not just that, but linking Hindi to other disciplines in SOAS, not just keeping it as something tucked away in a corner, but bringing it out with complet, with many other disciplines here at SOAS. I also want to thank Francesca as a colleague from the wider body of us at SOAS, not just the department, but all of us at SOAS, as a colleague, when no one will do it, Francesca will do it. I mean, you know, 
if we say in Indian English, she has rendered yeoman service to us all in the department. And to me particularly, I mean, my life at SOAS would have been not just unbearable, but impossible, frankly, if Francesca hadn't been there always as such a support to us in all ways. Francesca and I no longer have the lurking around bus stops at midnight and hanging around dubious areas of Indian cities together. Nowadays, we tend to see each other more to talk about teaching assessments, peer observation of teaching, research plans, and we've even been each other's heads of department. I was never quite sure which one of us was the head. But we've also had many other times together across this. We've seen many significant birthdays, perhaps too many with zeros on the end, some more recent than others, for which some of us have not yet been invited to a party. We've seen at least one wedding. But really for Francesca, we want to say just thank you for being Francesca. I think that's really been it for all of us. So now, just before I invite us all to a reception afterwards, there's one little joke Francesca and I have had for many years between us, in the manner of a Hindi film, perhaps. In a Hindi film, there's often a good sister and a bad sister. And sometimes, usually, they're played by the same actress. Well, Francesca and I don't really look alike. But, but, I thought if I wore black tonight, I'd be casting my role quite clearly, and I was glad to see Francesca in white. <laughs> But perhaps it's also covered by these robes, these differences can be removed. And just to say once again to Francesca, congratulations, a much deserved, perhaps overdue professorship. And we look forward to hearing the big talk at the end of the project next. Thank you, Francesca.